be somewhere working for my Lord. I'll be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. I'll be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. When he calls me, I will answer. When he calls me, I will answer. When he calls me, I will answer. I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. I'll be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. I'll be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. I will be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. I'll be somewhere working, somewhere working, somewhere working for my Lord. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to be inviting us to turn our Bibles to St. John chapter 14. I'm going to be reading from verse 15 to verse 26. St. John chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 15 to verse 26. Praise God. If he love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but he know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but he see me. Because I live, he shall live also. At that day, he shall know that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judah said unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode in him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These saying have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and shall bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Praise the Lord. We're going to be praying at this time. Lord, we thank you for your mercies. We are grateful for your grace. We are thankful, Lord, that you have kept us and have allowed us to come together another time to study your words. We pray as we are here that your presence will be with us. We pray you'll touch our minds. I pray that you'll use these lips, Lord, to speak in such a way that your children will be edified. And you'll receive the praise and the glory. We pray for your blessing upon those present and those who will be joining us online. 
Let your name be praised, and I pray, God, that teaching will be easy, as God, your spirit will just lead and direct. We surrender ourselves in your hands and continue to depend upon you. In Jesus' name, praise God. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to greet Deacon Burke and all the other saints present. Praise the Lord Jesus. I want to extend welcome to you. Welcome to those who are joining us online as well. I want to apologize for the absence of our pastor who is unavoidably absent tonight. Praise the Lord. And we continue to remember her. Praise the Lord Jesus. We are going to be focusing on the topic, profound questions in the Bible. Profound questions in the Bible. Praise the Lord Jesus. Profound questions in the Bible. Now, in, when I first started out at first, I thought it was going to be study just for one night. Because as far as I, I thought I would just find you know, a few. And, but I found that it might go beyond tonight, based on what I'm seeing. So we're looking at the topic, profound questions in the Bible. The first question we're going to look at, we're going to spend some time looking at, is what is truth? What is truth? Now, this question was asked by Pilate. Pilate was the one who said, what is truth? Praise the Lord Jesus. And it's an easy question to ask, very easy question to ask. But uh, when you look at it, you actually need to know what is truth. Praise the Lord Jesus. What is truth? Now, we're going to be reading the account as found in St. John 18. So we're going to be turning our Bibles to St. John chapter 18. St. John chapter 18, and we're going to be reading from verse 37 to verse 38. St. John 18, from verse 37 to verse 38. The scripture says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou, king, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause... Came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto him, unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Praise the Lord Jesus. So Pilate asks, what is truth? What is truth? Now for some persons, truth is something that can be proven. Something that can be proven to be so. That is truth. That's what some people take as truth. Praise the Lord Jesus. So some persons, the truth can be proven. That's for some persons. Praise the Lord Jesus. The truth for some persons is an honest account. An honest account. Praise the Lord Jesus. Oh, bless the Lord. But we're talking about truth as it relates to the Lord. We're going to see as it unfolds. It might be different. So we're, not, we're going to let it unfold. So, so Pilate heard Jesus speaking of truth. Jesus was the one who mentioned truth. And Pilate asked, what is truth? Pilate was not asking what is truth because he really wanted to find out. He was asking because Jesus spoke of truth. He was asking to suggest, you know, that what Jesus was calling truth was not necessarily truth. It wasn't an inquiry. He didn't wait for an answer. Pilate asked the question, but never waited for an answer. Pilate said it to justify himself. What did Pilate do? After he asked the question, he went out to the crowd and declared that Jesus was innocent. 
And then, what did he do? He, and the same man that he said was innocent, he handed him over for them to crucify him. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, Pilate, to Pilate, he seemed to take the truth as being relative. So based on situation, it could be truth or it was conditional. So he wasn't really valuing what he was saying in that way that we would have expected. Praise the Lord Jesus. And his actions are what told us that. Because he just recognized in talking to Jesus that he was innocent. He went and shared it that Jesus was innocent. But he never acted like the actions were not consistent if he was innocent. He handed Jesus over to be crucified. What is truth? Praise the Lord Jesus. So we don't want truth to be relative. We want truth to stand up as truth. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. It was a dangerous thing that he did. Asking the question, what is truth? You expected him to find out what was the truth. He should have really sought the truth. Rather than just asking the question and dismissing it. Now, people today need to know the truth. Oh, praise the Lord. We need to know what is truth. Now, if we don't know what is truth, we'll embrace a lie and call it truth. So we have got to be very careful when it comes to talking about truth. Now, there are some persons who will tell you, I have the truth. And you'll wonder, why is it you're declaring you have the truth? If you have the truth, persons will know. But many times... They are doing that to, so it's, it appeals to the psyche. In their minds, they become comfortable that they have the truth. But they're not, really, they're not totally convinced. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Not totally convinced at all. But there is a truth as it pertains to Jesus. Now look at Jesus' answer in the latter part of verse 37 of St. John 18. So Jesus is speaking. He said, Thou sayest, I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Jesus says he came to what? Bear witness unto the truth. Every one of, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. How is Jesus speaking to us today? Everyone that is of the truth, hear it, my voice. How is he speaking? He's speaking through the word. He's, speak, he's speaking through preaching. He's speaking through teaching. Even in songs. There are some persons, the lyrics of the song and the rhythm is what reached them. It was appealing they spent enough time listening until the word started to impact their hearts. Not necessarily preaching. And that is why it is so important that when we are listening to songs, we listen to the lyrics. If the lyrical content is not sound, it doesn't matter how the, the quality of the music, be careful. Because sometimes, you know, because music tend to cause persons to respond without sometimes they even realize that they're tapping their feet or rocking. You might just be dancing to something and giving glory to the devil. So we ought to be careful. Everyone that is of the truth, hear it, my voice. So the, when the Lord speaks, you will hear and you will respond. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now in St. John 8 verse 32, let's go over to St. John 8 verse 32. So we're looking at what is truth. St. John 8, and we're going to verse 32. He says, yes, and he, sh ready, let's go. And he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth liberates. 
It therefore means that if persons don't know the truth, they are bound. Now, I don't want to be bound by religion. Religion should liberate me from the captive hold of sin. Praise the Lord Jesus. I want to know Jesus until I love him so much that I don't want to go away from him. I don't want to be bound by religion. Empty religion cannot save. It is Jesus that saves. So I want to have a connection with the Lord. I want to establish my relationship. I want to maintain my relationship so that when he speaks, I will respond. I need to know Jesus to know the truth. Praise the Lord Jesus. So it's important that we know him. Praise the Lord. So, and he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We need to know what is the truth. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, listen to truth. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. Way back there in the Old Testament, the Lord our God is one. Who was their God? Jehovah. So while there were persons who were worshipping a multiplicity or worshipping many gods, the Jews knew one God. They were worshipping one God. There was no mention of any trinity or any father, son, holy. They knew one God. They knew one God. They knew one God. So here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Praise the Lord. Now, you will see how that is liberating in a short while. Now, let's turn our Bibles, going back to the New Testament. This time, we're going to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. And we're looking at what is truth. What is truth? That question was asked by Pilate. 2 Corinthians 9. And we're going to verse 19. Please go ahead. Second Corinthians 5. We're reading the 19th verse. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So, to wit means to know. What do we need to know? God was in Christ. Have you noticed that it says God was in Christ? Christ? How was God in Christ? How was God in Christ? The Spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus. The Spirit. God is a Spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What was inside this body was the spirit of God. Praise the Lord. So he could speak to the wind and the wind responded to his voice because he was God. He could speak to the dead and the dead was raised. He was God. He could speak to the fig tree and the fig tree withered. He was God. Praise the Lord. He was God. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. So God was in Christ. Now what was God doing in Christ? He was reconciling the world unto himself. In other words, he was bringing them back. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. He never came to judge them. He was not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he had given a ministry to us. All of us are a part of this ministry of reconciliation. Bringing those persons who are out there to the Lord. We belong to him. And we drifted away. Adam and Eve disobeyed the instruction, the commands. They disobeyed the command. And because of that, or as a consequence, sin came. Way back there in the Garden of Eden, there was a type. Adam and Eve found they were naked. They were not proud. They somehow wanted to cover their nakedness. And if we see people walking around today, if they are not mentally ill, 
they believe they are dressing in a very modern way. So modern, the modern society seem to believe that the more you expose some part, some part of the society, that is, the more you are exposed, the more modern you are. You are with it, or you're with it. Praise the Lord. But that is not that well. Let's let's get it back get back to the lesson. So, the ministry that we're given is one of reconciliation. So way back there in the garden, when they sued the fig leaves and they found they were naked, they tried to cover themselves. And the Lord, recognizing that the fig leaves would not last, it would not do, would not be sufficient, it would not suffice, God intervened. So what he did, they were clothed, they were covered with animal skin. Blood had to be shed for the covering to be prepared. And way back there, the type is that Blood had to be shed for sins to be forgiven. We don't take care of the sin. We, just, we, we can't justify our way. He justifies us. Praise the Lord Jesus. So some person would say, boy, this man is a good man, man. So when you need the money, you just go to him you know, and you borrow it. And maybe just say, Let's say, go on, man, it's all right. He's a good man. Your self-righteousness will not do. There are some, there are some, some things that you have got to meet. Praise the Lord Jesus. So, he created, a, God provided the way. The type there was that blood had to be shed. And he became that, that, that lamb. He died on the cross. When John saw him, John said, Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He has taken away the sin. What sin? That sin that we inherited from Adam. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. So, God was in Christ. And some people love to say, well... If, if, if God is in Jesus, we are... Paul says in him, we move and have our being. He filled the universe. Praise the Lord. The psalmist says, if I take the winds of the morning and go to the uttermost part of the earth, behold, he's there. God is everywhere. We know it. The word says it. We, we, we are familiar with that. He's everywhere. Jesus stood before Nicodemus in St. John chapter 3. He was speaking to Nicodemus, yet he was talking about the Son of God that is in heaven. Why? He was God. He was God. You can search it for yourself. Don't want to drift away too much. Praise the Lord. So he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So he's one, one God. Now in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16. The word says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, Believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest, or God was made known in the flesh. How was God made known in the flesh? When was God made known in the flesh? When he was born, yes. Of course. Yes. Mary asked the angel. The angel was saying, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored. And start to tell Mary that she was going to have this, this, this baby. Mary said, how can this be? Seeing that I don't know any man. I don't know any man. I'm not having any relationship to be able to produce a child. It's a good question she asked. Yes. Mary was aware that it requires a man and a woman for a baby to be formed. And so Mary asked, how? She was told that the power, that power from an eye would overshadow her. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, he wasn't born of the will of man or the will of flesh. All right? It was God who had done that. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, so he was made known in flesh. Now, if you ask Little children, why did Jesus come? They would give an, an answer, a very appropriate answer. Most children are able to tell you that he came to do what? He came to save us, yes. But how did he save us? 
He died in our stead. We should have died. And he died in our stead. His death, burial, and resurrection is what gives us hope. And the hope is described as a lively hope. We know we will live again. He has come to give us life. The Bible says the thief, he cometh but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that he might have life and have it more abundantly. God came. How did he come? He came as a babe. He put on flesh. Oh, praise the Lord. So the Bible says God was manifesting flesh. He was justified in the spirit. So in this flesh was dwelling spirit. Though we know God is a spirit, of right? But he rolled back that curtain, that, that the flesh. At one time when he was with the disciples, what we call the transfiguration, they saw the glory of God and they saw the, the, the prophets there. So he, he, he demonstrated all of that. Praise the Lord. He was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. He went about preaching and as he taught many believed Bill, they were believed in the world and it concluded by saying received up to glory in the latter part of when we read acts chapter one we read of the ascension the disciples were there and they they, they were looking up so the men who were in white apparel said why stand he gazing up into heaven this same Jesus is going to come again in like manner. He's coming again. Who? Jesus came on the face of the earth. He went up and he's coming again. So God came among us. God came among us. We'll talk about that some more later. He came among us. Praise the Lord. So, in Isaiah 43 verse 11, Isaiah 43 verse 11, still talking about truth, right? Isaiah 43, verse 11. The scripture says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Look at it again. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now, this was in the book of Isaiah, this was in reference to God. So, he is our Savior, not another. He's our Savior. It is therefore not surprising, since we read about it, the prophet had made this utterance, that he is our Savior. When we go to St. Matthew 1, verse 21, it is confirmed. So, Joseph was planning to put away Mary because Mary was found with child. And he knew it, he wasn't the father. So he decided he was going to put her away. He, he was very caring, though, because he decided he wasn't going to make a public show. He was going to do it privately. But the angel came to him and spoke to him and assured him, this child is not an ordinary child. It's of the Holy Ghost. Stay with her, man. Don't put her away. Now, in verse 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, isn't that interesting? We're speaking about a baby. A baby? Yet, the angel is saying, his people? So the people belong to him already? How is that? Because God put on flesh. Now, if we go down to verse 21, we see that it was a fulfillment of the prophecy, and he shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. So God came among us. Why? For the redemption of our souls, so that we might have salvation. He purchased our salvation with his own blood. That is truth. So the question is, what is truth? That is truth, that there is one God. Oh, the text, it was taken from St. Matthew 1, verse 21. St. Matthew 1, verse 21. So the Savior is Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. The Savior is Jesus. 
So the Savior spoken of in the Old Testament is not a different Savior. The same Savior. In fact, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Not a different God. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. Despite the fact that it's a different dispensation. So the big topic we're looking at, the big topic is profound questions in the Bible. Profound questions in the Bible. Now we're going to conclude this session and we're going to go to another, another question that is asked. What shall I do? Who asked that question? What shall I do? Paul asked the question. Very good. Paul asked the question when he was traveling to Damascus on his way to persecute the Christians. While he was on his way, he was confronted. Jesus was there. Jesus met him on the way. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. And it was while he was on the way that he asked the question, what shall I do? All right, so let's read for ourselves. We're going to turn to Acts chapter 22. Paul was sharing his testimony about his conversion. We ought to be ready to share our testimonies about how we were converted. It's nothing to be ashamed of. We need to tell people who we were and how God's power transformed us. We were destined for health consuming flame. And if God never stopped us in our tracks, we some of us would be the worst persons you could, could think of. But thank God, His grace and mercy made a difference in our lives. That's why we are who we are. It's not because of our goodness. God's grace and mercy made a difference in our lives. So we're not to be ashamed to testify about how God made a difference. He has been keeping us too. There's an enemy of our souls that wants us to lose our way, to let go of this hope of eternal life. But he provides a way. He has a way of sustaining us. And that's why we are keeping, not ourselves, but he, he, he makes a way. All right, so Acts chapter 22, verse 6 to 10, and it came to pass that as I made my journey... And was come nigh unto Damascus about noon. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed. For D to do. Now we're going to examine some responses. Now Paul didn't ask, What will you do, Lord? He never said, Lord, what are you going to do now? He didn't say that. All right? So he looked at himself and he said, hmm? What shall I do? Right away, he was ready to serve the Lord. Now, I want us to bear in mind, for those of us who are familiar with Paul, Paul was highly religious. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel and he learned the law. He knew it. He learned from the best. Yes, you're correct. He knew the law. But the dispensation of the law had come to an end. Jesus' death brought ushered in a new dispensation. It was now the dispensation of grace. Or some persons call it the dispensation of the church. Paul was zealous. He had a drive. He had a passion for the things of Christ. Yet, 
he had not had a revelation as to who Jesus really is. And there are many persons who are genuine. They're genuine in their relationship with God, but they don't know God. And we sometimes observe them and would make comments, but guess what? They are trying their best. They don't know any better. And we have got to be the ones to pray for them, to reach out to them that they might come to a knowledge, they might gain the knowledge as to who Jesus is. So, Paul saw himself. He acknowledged God as Lord and all of that. He, he was ready, ready, ready to serve. Now, before we discuss you know, what was happening with Paul uh, right there as he encountered the Lord, I want us to look closely at another scripture, and then we'll come back to what we look, were looking at earlier in, um, in Acts 22. So we're going to go over now. So we're looking still at Paul, but we're going to go over to Romans 14, verse 10 to 12. Romans 14, verse 10. We're going down to verse 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Paul acknowledged him as Lord. Isn't that interesting? Paul acknowledged him as Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. Paul descended from the ass, not deliberately. The bright light struck him and he fell to the ground. Praise the Lord Jesus. And he was willing to humble himself. He was willing to yield, to surrender, yes. Praise the Lord Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord. Now, we have got to learn to dedicate ourselves to Christ. Now, what do we mean by dedicating ourselves to Christ? In everything that we do, we're giving God glory. So at work, we are the best worker. While some persons will look for the shortcut, want to leave early when they can leave early, slip through the door and so on, as Christians, we don't do that. No. They must say, if one person not leaving is this brother, can this person a Christian? He's not do them things, man. No, not him. So we've got to be, you know, really dedicated, not just seasonally, but consistently. Praise the Lord. We have got to make some sacrifice if we're going to be serving God. We've got to be willing to let go of something and to embrace other things. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now we're still talking about Paul, you know, but we'll get back to him, right? Now, we're going to St. Luke 9, verse 62. St. Luke 9, verse 62. Now, did I say St. Luke? Yes. St. Luke 9, verse 62. Found it. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. So if we start to serve God, let's keep going. Don't go back. Now, we have a popular song, not going back to the things I used to do and all of that. And we have some others, I'll never look back. No, never look back and all of that. The scripture says, remember Lot's wife. It's there for a reason. People can turn back. But when you're serving God, you should have no intention of turning back. No wonder the song where it depends the song. I am determined to hold on to the end. So we have got to keep going forward, not looking back, not looking back. So when you put your hand to the plow, when you're going to work, you keep working, keep working, keep working, keep going, keep going. Don't turn back. For us, the Lord expects of us a consistent personal commitment with him. Not 
on the day that you might assemble to worship a special day, you are committed for that entire day. Every day of the week. So in St. John 41, we're saying, our fathers worship in the mountain are no greater. You said, you know, true worshipers the Lord wants. True worshipers are consistently Christians. Not seasonal. We are Christians every day. We do not compromise. We maintain high holy standard or high standards of holiness. So if it is wrong to do something on Sunday, it is wrong to do something on Monday, it is wrong to do something on Wednesday, it's not just a particular day. Praise the Lord Jesus. So we will not willingly sin. And we know it's sin. Sometimes we do some things we don't realize we're, we're hurting people and so on, offending them. But we are not going to do that because we are commitment. We are, sorry, we are committed. Praise the Lord Jesus. So Paul was on his journey to Damascus. And he was not aware that this journey to Damascus was going to be the beginning of a journey with the Lord Jesus. Some people who became Christians never planned to become Christians. Some persons visited church because they were invited to church. And the Spirit of the Lord made a difference and made an impact, and they never went back. And many persons will tell you they, they kept visiting, and they don't even know what was drawing them. They just kept coming until they surrendered fully. Praise the Lord Jesus. So we, don't, we want to remain committed and not to go back. Praise the Lord Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord. Now, at the end of Paul's Christian walk, he was able to, to, to say some things in um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. He was able to make an utterance. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me that day. And not me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul remained faithful unto death is damascus encounter changed him for life now remember ananias was questioning the lord and reminding the lord of his character how he was going and hurting the church and the lord said unto him that he will be hmm, he's a chosen vessel unto me going to suffer some things and paul fulfilled everything there is a destiny that is out there for us. God has a purpose for our lives. And as long as we walk close to him, it will be fulfilled. Everyone in the church has something to do in terms of the growth of the church. All of us have a role to play. Some of us don't talk a lot, but we are good smilers. We can smile. We can become greeters. We can stand at the door and we give people a nod and we shake their hands. Yes. Because some of us, if we are to ever to talk, we will stutter. And even if, because we get very anxious and the word is not flowing and the stuttering there might just turn off some person. Praise the Lord Jesus. Or some of us, we don't smile easily. So we would not be, we, be not the door would not be the place for us. All right. Bless the Lord Jesus. Some of us, we are able to articulate well. We are able to pronounce the word and to enunciate or whatever. We're able to speak in a way that persons readily understand. So we would be good at reading the announcements. It's very important that when announcements are being read, persons are able to understand so that they'll remember. But if you're up there and they're wondering what you're saying, what is he saying? Hmm? Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. So all of us have got a purpose in the church. Praise the Lord Jesus. Paul stopped what he was doing. What was Paul going to Damascus to do? Put away those people who were talking about Jesus. He saw them as heretics. He believed their doctrine was strange. They were not embracing what he was standing up for. So he wanted to put them away. He stopped. And brethren, when we come to the Lord, we need to stop doing some things we used to do. Somebody saying it's a great change since I was born. There must be a difference. We can't be playing church. Well, let me rephrase. We should not be a 
part of the church today and tomorrow we're not a part of the church. We need to be consistent in our walk. We need to be obedient. Paul was obedient. Praise the Lord. So we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient. Praise the Lord Jesus. So he stopped doing what he was, what he was engaging. And guess what? He found out what he should do. What was Paul told? Let's see. So Jesus did not say to Paul, you have been a Pharisee too long. Oh, he didn't say that at all. Didn't tell him that he was a Pharisee too long or anything like that. He told him what he needed to do. Praise the Lord. So he wanted to know what to do, and the Lord told him that he should. So let's verse 10 of Acts 22. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And let's look at the Lord's response. And the Lord said unto me, arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Arise and go to Damascus. No. Paul went. Hmm? No, Paul never just started to be engaged in the work of the Lord just like that, you know. He spent some time in the Arabian desert. He had revelation as to who the Lord was. And then he started to work. God know how to fix us up. He will empower us. He will cause us to learn enough about him that we are able to stand up to the testings and the trials. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, another instruction Paul received and he obeyed in verse 16 of Acts 22. And now, why tarriest thou? And I said, what are you waiting for, Paul? Hmm? Arise and be baptized. And wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How was Paul baptized? Was Paul religious? I would like for us to answer these questions. Was Paul a religious man? Are we sure he was religious? What religion Paul say he was embracing? That of his fathers. Yes, he did. The scripture said that. He was embracing that of his fathers. But he found something different. Have we noticed that? He was religious. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He, in other words, he knew the law inside out. He knew the customs. He knew what was expected. He was rising to be a great leader. But his encounter with Jesus transformed all of that he, he was now changed praise the lord jesus he was now changed he was so humble where he went about with an aggression to get at the people of god he was saying lord what will thou have me to do that's a big change that's a big change and what did paul do he was baptized he confessed jesus hmm? now remember as far as Paul was concerned, these people were preaching and teaching Jesus. <laughs> he was, they were the ones who he was attacking, remember? They were being put into prisons and all of that. He went to Damascus to carry them back bound to deal with them. He wasn't to take them to a feast. Praise the Lord. But Jesus made the difference. Praise the Lord Jesus. Jesus made the difference. Praise the Lord Jesus. In Philippians 2 verse 10, we, that name is powerful. I am Jesus. That's how the answer came. I am Jesus. Oh, bless the Lord Jesus. And did Paul bow to the name? Yes, he fell from the ass or whatever beast he was on. He fell. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to look about reconciliation and loyalty. Now Paul was working against the Lord. Lord said, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul, you are hurting yourself by fighting against the church. Hello? There are some persons who will come against the church, and they don't even realize they're coming against the church. So they'll say things that are sometimes bordering being blaspheming or blasphemous. People don't want to blaspheme the church, blaspheme the name of the Lord. So be careful what you say about the church. 
It is God's church. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. So who are you to speak against the church? Be careful. Let's he judge you. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hand of God. So humble yourself. If you don't have anything to say, say, Lord have mercy. Turn it over to him. Don't say anything that you shouldn't say. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Paul was willing to give up his best, to give everything. He was going against the Lord, by like going against his church. But when the Lord touched him, reconciliation took place. Now, Paul wrote, I am not sure if, yes, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19 to 20. Look at what he wrote. Some people said some things that we don't understand in the scripture, but the scriptures are here to talk to us. So it says, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto itself, and so on. And we had, well, let me read. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as through God did beseech you by us, we pray in Christ's stead, he be reconciled to God. Paul praying for reconciliation. That you, all of you come to God, come back to God. He recognized that he, he wasn't really with God. He was deeply involved in religion. He was embracing religion. And may I say, religion is not going to be saving anybody. So as proud as you are to declare that I am one of the... Be careful, that doesn't save you. That don't save you at all. That don't save you. But we want to be like Paul. So Paul was told that he should go to Damascus. What, and he, when he was told that he should arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, he was baptized. He was baptized. And he became a good example until we talk about him a lot. Faithful and dedicated. And we want to be loyal like him. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I think we have time that we can look at one last one. So I have others, but we're not going to look at all of them tonight. Why? Because time is running away. Now, this, this question, now we're looking at profound questions in the Bible. Who is the prophet speaking about? That was the question. Anybody can tell who, asked that, who was the que person asking that question? Who is the prophet speaking about? Now, I'm sure we all know, yes? That's correct. That's correct. It's the Ethiopian eunuch, or yes, that's the Ethiopian, Ethiopian executive. Some people, financial executive. Right, you're correct. You are correct. When he was, as he was traveling on his lonely road, and he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and the Lord made some provision where Philip had joined him, and, he, you know, Philip said to him, understand this now what the read is? I think we can actually read the account, and then we talk about it. So we're going to Acts chapter 8. It's a bit lengthy. But we can read fast. All right? Acts chapter 8. I'm not going to read all of it. Just to get the gist. All right. So we're at Acts chapter 8. And we're going to be reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 8. We're reading from verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. Some say Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, an eunuch of, the, of great authority on the Candies, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He came to Jerusalem to worship. Let's notice that. Something was happening. He was reading the word, and he came to Jerusalem to worship. Was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, he says, Isaiah, so we know it's Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Philip did what? Aha. Uh -huh. Some things we've got to do it urgently. Now, some of us, we just do things in our own time, but some things we've got to respond quickly if we might just miss the moment. 
if Philip was just jogging, it probably wouldn't, would take a while to catch up. But he'd catch up in time so that they would get near to water when the man's heart was, was burning. Praise the Lord. Let's continue. Philip ran to her to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Many people read the Bible and don't understand, you know. They don't understand the scriptures. And so Philip asks. He said, how can I accept some man should, should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So Philip was invited to come and sit with him. Interesting. So there was an opportunity here. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before a shearer. So, he op so open he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? I want to know, man. Who is this prophet talking about? Of himself? Or of some other man? Good questions, right? Yes. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. Strategy, right? Philip didn't jump all over the place. You know, Philip he was using what was present, what he was familiar with, to open his, to, to him other things. So Philip started there. Praise the Lord Jesus. So the scripture said Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture to preach unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Hello? He saw water and he wanted to be baptized. I don't think it was a cup of water that was there. It was enough for him to go in and to, be, to go under and to come up out of the water. Praise the Lord. After all, when we look closely at the word baptism, it means to bury or to plunge or, or to immerse. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So he had to believe the scripture. He had to believe that about what he was hearing about, about just and all of that. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Wow. I think he was really convicted. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, notice, went down both into the water. Not Philip going to catch some water and to come and baptize him by sprinkling. Or to pour some on his head. They went down. The scripture says it clearly. They went down both Philip and the eunuch. And he, was, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That the eunuch saw him no more. But look at this. And he went on his way rejoicing. Something happened that caused him to be so happy. He was rejoicing. But Philip was found as Azostos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. To Caesarea. Praise the Lord Jesus. So, the Lord did minister to him. So, the question that was asked, do you understand what you're reading? Hmm? The man said, how can I unless somebody guide me? Hmm? Somebody need to explain this thing to me. Praise the Lord. He invited Philip to come up into the chariot. Praise the Lord Jesus. He wanted to know who the prophet was speaking about, whether it was himself or another person. Praise the Lord Jesus. It was the, U, the, the Ethiopian eunuch who noticed the water. Now, brethren, when we are teaching on Bible studies, we are to be believing that God is working on the person. God will work on them in such a way that they will have the desire to be baptized. They'll have the desire to have God's spirit dwelling within them. We can't push it into them. But God is able. He is the one that saves. Praise the Lord. So Paul says, look man. Paul planted Apollos, watered it, but he gives the increase. He's the one that saves the soul. Our part is to make it known. We want to tell it. We want to share that somebody might hear there's a God and know that he's to be worshipped. 
but we can't put God into them. It is God. So let's do our part and lift our faith and believe God for the extraordinary. God can still use us to reach them, but he's the one that will save their souls. He's the one that works on the inside. So they listen, they hear what you're saying. They start to exercise their faith and to believe he will touch their hearts. You can't touch the heart. He will touch their hearts. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now when he said he wanted to believe, Philip asked him if he really believed, you know, and so on. And, and he said, yes, he believed that Jesus is the son of God. Praise God. It suggests that he, he was ministered to. Praise the name of the Lord. There are other questions Philip could have asked. But Philip recognized if you don't believe, it doesn't make sense. It's important for people to acknowledge who God is. They that come to the Lord must believe that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. You've got to believe he will respond to your prayer. Say, Lord, forgive me. He will forgive. We've got to believe that he will forgive. Don't just ask him to forgive because you're being told, confess your sin and ask the Lord to forgive you. Believe God is going to forgive me. That's why I'm asking. Now, some of us exercise our faith when circumstances are out of our control. We, 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 this seems hopeless. Hmm? We hear that oh, we're going to be out of a job and you, we, we know that the conditions, the economic conditions are, 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 are difficult, unpredictable and, and all of that because of whatever is happening with the war and all of that. And some of us start to pray to the God and we call him all Jehovah Jireh and all of that because we believe. We know God can provide, you know. We have heard it over and over. But guess what? We must get one job because we're not going to serve. And we become so desperate that we start to read. But brethren, we can talk to him about simple things and believe. And he can still work. It's not just the big thing. He's still God. If you go to work and you went to work without lunch money, you just had a bottle of water. And somebody bought the lunch and said, boy, I can't eat this. This is too much. I say, Mr. Drizzle, <laughs> can you share this with me? This is too much. You know, it's God provided, but they don't even know it's God provided. They went somewhere to buy the lunch and they didn't know the portions. And they get more than, God know that you needed some, so God let them. And you say, thank you, God. God provide lunch. Look at this. Hmm? At some people's workplace, they have utensils and things. They can't even share it out and nobody would know unless they share it. Says, it's both of us are sharing lunch. You go to the lunchroom and you're having your lunch. God have a way of showing up. So, so brethren, he can take care of the small things and we just need to exercise our faith. He can take care of the big things too. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord. So God did minister to this, this, this um, executive, this, this, the man who was in charge of the treasurer. Praise the Lord. Or the treasurer, he was the treasurer. God did. It's interesting to know that he went to Jerusalem to worship. When persons come to the house of the Lord to worship, we want true worship to be here, that they are impacted. And the church is to be attractive. And who makes the church attractive? We are responsible for making the church attractive. So we need to be careful of the things we talk about. If I'm going to talk about something that is going to let my church look ugly, I better swallow it. Don't talk. Because I could be hindering somebody who wants to come. Praise the Lord. I talk about miracles. I'm at work, Mr. Talk about miracles from time to some persons if we're having a one-to-one -one or so on. He said, God has worked miracles since I've been at church, you know. God has worked miracles. And I, and I, I, I love to say, not miracles where people jump around and all, and, and all sorts of things. Pray. People pray. And the results are beyond human understanding. They don't understand. It's not supposed to happen. It goes against what the doctors know. It goes beyond the medicine. But God has healed. There are many instances where persons have been healed. And it's not in the dramatic way that we see be demonstrating on our television. God heals. He's still a healer. And I've heard of persons who God made provision for in extraordinary ways. Like, for example, some persons are not qualified for some jobs. But somehow they went to the interview and the, somebody said, there's something about that, that, that brother or that man. There's something about that lady. And somebody just feels, you know, 
they might have demonstrated the competencies that are needed. They might not have the experience and probably not the type of qualification, but they have the potential. They're trainable. And somebody said, no, man, I think this person should be given a chance. And I've known of persons who have testified that the Lord has provided jobs for them that they're not qualified for. And they do well. You know why? God was with them. They do well. Praise the Lord. So God is able. God is able. God is able. God is able. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. God is able. So when people come to church to worship, brethren, let's really worship. Let's worship. Let's worship. We come to worship. We come to lift up our praises to the Lord. We come to adore him. Oh, bless the Lord Jesus. We're having, um, you know, we're coming to, it's not by ourselves. And when we come together, we should come believing. We, we need to believe God is going to do something. God is going to do something and God will do it. Let's believe God. God is going to do something and he will do it. Praise the Lord. So let's believe. Let's believe. Let's believe. We don't want persons to come and to leave the same way. We want God to touch them. He's the one that can minister to their hearts. Praise the Lord. Now, a lot of times the word is preached, a seed is sown. You can't know that a seed is sown, but the person knows what they feel inside. And the word, and it's, God can bring it back to their remembrance. And it's our duty to pray. Lord, we had six visitors today. On Sunday, we had maybe eight or ten or so. Yes. So we need to be praying, Lord, touch everyone. Let them remember something from the service that's going to draw them close to you. They need Jesus. Praise God, people need the Lord. So let's, when they come to worship, I just believe the worship experience should not be just an, an ordinary thing. God needs to be present among us, and he's present in, if we have the Holy Ghost, he's here. We're more than the number, we're more than two or three. We just need to worship and God will show up and he will, he, will, he will save souls. Praise the Lord Jesus. It's interesting now. We're, we're, we're concluding. Baptism. So he believed and he confessed Jesus. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Persons don't just get baptized because they feel like they want to baptize. John said, come and bring forth meat. Fruit, meat for repentance. That's what he said. In other words, you want to be baptized? You need to repent. Do something. Prepare yourself. Don't just jump into it. Praise the Lord Jesus. So we want for them to be ready. And guess what? You can be ready in just a minute. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. He will forgive you right where you are. And you can be baptized, but you must repent before you are baptized. Baptism is an essential part of salvation. It's essential. Although we're not really studying baptism, but it saves. Baptism saves. Praise the Lord Jesus. So it is not optional, as some person would want to say. It's not optional. It is necessary for our salvation. Praise the Lord. We must be baptized. And of course, we read... As the, Jesus was speaking with the disciples, Jesus called the meeting. And they went in, in St. Matthew 28. They went up to the mount. He said to them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And they obeyed. They went and they baptized persons in the name. And what name do we see in the book of Acts? Jesus. They baptized them in the name of Jesus. That's the saving name. So, they obeyed by baptizing in the name. Which name was called? Jesus. Jesus. I'm just saying that for persons who can research that in their own time. Now, we're going to close with this scripture, Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 3 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
Even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. So baptism identifies us with the death of Jesus. We are buried with him. Now, when you think about a burial, the body goes under. That's why the persons who are dealing with that, they call them the undertaker. The body goes under. Praise the Lord. When I am baptized in Jesus' name, I am identifying with his death. Praise the Lord. And I rise up out of that water to, to walk in the newness of life. What brings about the difference in my life? The Spirit of the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord Jesus. Some things that I found appealing, some things that cause a compulsion, like I have to do this, I have to do that. God's Spirit help us to live above that. Praise the Lord. No wonder Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that dwelleth in me. I have strength, not because I, of myself, but the God in me helps me. Praise the Lord. I don't forgive people because I love to forgive people. Sometimes they really set out to hurt me and I'm hurt. But the Bible says, if you don't forgive your brother, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. So I've got to dig deep. That means I've got to go beyond the ordinary because I can't keep bitterness in my heart. It's not going to cause me to grow. It's going to be a hindrance. I'm bitter. I'm not going to feel his presence. I'm not going to touch God. My prayers are going to be hindered. Praise the Lord Jesus. Do you know that the Bible speaks about husbands taking care of their wives? And if the husband does certain things, the prayer will be hindered? Yes. Prayers can be hindered because your heart not right. So can you imagine... I have done my wife wrong and I'm praying like what I'm even shouting loud. God and God and Lord. And my prayer not going anywhere. Just sounds like a shout disturbing people. Hmm? Because I'm not sincere. I'm not genuine. I need to fix up. Heart not right. We can't afford to come to church, brethren, just for coming to church sake. We don't want to say hallelujah because it is fashionable. It's, no. When I say hallelujah, I am praising God. I'm giving myself, I say, Lord, I give my being to you. I'm doing it on purpose, and I should mean it. Praise the Lord. When we are praising God, brethren, and we really praise God from the depths of our heart, something happens. I've heard of many children who are playing, and God's presence show up. And, and it is man the manifestation is there. Sometimes the tears start to flow, they don't know why they're crying and all of that. Because guess what? They are very sincere in their play. So even though they're playing, God is responding. God knows their heart. Praise the Lord. So we want to be sincere. We want to be sincere. If I start the other one, we might, I don't know. All right, so let me just wrap up. I'm wrapping up. Praise the Lord, Jesus. We might be sincere. So I'm going to just recap what we have done tonight. And then you can ask some questions. So we're looking at profound questions in the Bible, and so far we have looked at three, three so far. The first one we look at is, what is truth? What is truth? That was asked by Pilate, and the truth is that there is one God, and it is through him that we are saved, as he came in the form of flesh and all of that. We talked about that, and then we went on to another question. Who, what shall I do came next? Thank you very much. The next one, yes, what shall I do was the next one. What shall I do? And that was asked by Paul. Probably didn't ask it the way I have stated it here, but he wanted to do. Not what he needed to do to be saved in this, is that he was asking, you know, what God wanted him to do. Praise the Lord Jesus. And the latter one we asked was, what did we ask for the last one? Trying to find it. Who is the prophet speaking about? And he was speaking about Jesus, of course. So, for next week, we're going to look at, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
And then we will look at this one. Brethren, what shall we do? In other words, men and brethren, what shall we do? All right? And then we look at what is your life? What is your life? There are other things we can look at, but um, yes, there are other things. It's going to take us maybe beyond next week, because there are other things. But I, I just want us to have, have an idea, so some of us know those questions, so we can read around them. Now we're going to open up for questions. You're free to ask the questions. It doesn't have to necessarily pertain to the lesson that we have looked at. It can be something different. Any questions? Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right. Now, I want to just remind us that all of us are supposed to be inviting persons to church. And I want to commend those persons who had invited persons to church on Sunday. We had a, lot of, a good number of visitors. And we'd like more persons to be coming when you invite them to church. You pray about it and all of that. We believe in God that the word will be preached in such a way that their lives will be touched and they will not leave the same way that they have come. We want to pray that the worship, everything that God, it, you know, we will worship in such a way that God's presence will show up and so people will be ministered to. Now, we're going to be talking some more on Sunday. We need, we're going to be receiving some personal evangelism cards and all of us are going to be involved in soul winning. So whether you talk a lot or you don't talk a lot, all of us are going to be reaching out to persons. We're going to target souls. We can do it under God. God can use us in ways that we don't even know that he can. And all we've got to do is to avail ourselves. So we're going to keep walk close to the Lord and we're going to believe God for the extraordinary. Praise the Lord. So we're going to target five persons at a time. And we are believing God that at least one out of the five souls will be one to the Lord. All right? We're going to be closing in prayer. Oh, there's a question. Question, okay. God is able to do all things. God is able. God is able. God is able. So we believe in God. We believe in God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is it wrong to forgive someone but still remembering the wrongs that he or she has done? All right. So the question is, is it wrong to, to forgive for someone but still remember the, the things that they have done? All right. Now, a lot of persons will, I've, I've heard that said in a different way, like, I will forgive, but I'm not going to forget. Now, I don't think we should set out or the question says, if it's wrong to forgive and, for, uh, and still remember. We should always seek to forgive and we should try to forget. Now, the Bible talks about the Lord casting our sins in this, uh, in this yeah, forgetfulness. So we don't want to be remembering. You know why? When you remember, it can cause emotion. It evokes emotions and cause anger and so on. Especially if it wasn't resolved properly. So we'd want to forgive and forget. Now, as human, you will remember. It's not just going to just go away like that. But over time, you find it will go. But don't set out to hold on to it. Is it that you forget the incident or you forget the hurt that you felt? You try to move beyond the hurt. But you may still remember the you incident. You might still remember what have happened, yes. But I don't want... You, we don't want to... Hold on to it so that bitterness is there. Praise the Lord. So somebody can do you wrong, and you, you might still remember, but because you forgive the person, if you even talk about it, you won't get emotional. If you talk about it, you're getting emotional, you might not know, but that is showing that you, do, you have not gotten over it. It's still hurting. So it's like, if we talk about a relationship, in relationships, every relationship, we will have conflicts at times. We don't always agree. And it doesn't mean because you have a conflict, it's something boisterous and loud. But you might not agree. So you might decide, I have been having chocolate tea for five mornings. I want something different. And your wife might say, this is what may have. And this may put panda if you don't want it or whatever. And it can cause the person to be offended and so on. 
he talk about it, say, you know, I didn't mean anything. I was just tired of having this thing, and so on. And of course, because we as men, sometimes we are demanding, the wife forgive you. But if she going to say, uh, if, or if she's going to do so, boy, me, you're going to make your own tea going forward because you're going to make what you want because you're going to say whatever, whatever. And so we need to forgive. And when you forgive, you move beyond. And you can talk about it. You say, you know, I was so surprised. You forgive. And you, when you talk about it, the emotions won't be there because you just let go of all of that. But because our memories are, we have good memories. Memories are still sharp, still alert. You're going to remember, but it shouldn't be that you remember and you feel hurt. All right? So in relationship, things happen, but we've got to learn to forgive and to move beyond. For relationships to last, forgiveness has to be in it. Forgiveness has to be in the mix. Yes, sometimes, some, sometimes, some, some, some spouse out hurt each other without setting out to hurt each other. But you, you forgive and move on. So, yes, you might still remember, but don't set out to remember. All right? Bless the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Yes, there's another question. Praise God. Bless the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord, everybody. Yes, we will remember... But when you can really talk about it and have that peace on the inside, that is how you know that you really forgive the person. That's true. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yes, that's how you know you're really forgiving the person. Because guess what? You, 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 the, the earth is not there. Praise the Lord Jesus. And brethren, in this life, we've got to learn to really live what we say or the scriptures, whatever we preach, we've got to live it. It's a real... Christian walk that we are on, a real journey, and there will be obstacles. We're going to have cor turns and corners and, and so on, but guess what? That's what caused the journey not to be boring, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. And guess what? The victories are sweet. To know that you forgive this person and you know the, the magnitude of what the person has done, the victory is sweet, brethren. The victory is sweet. And guess what? It's better for you to let go than for the Holy Spirit to rebuke you. You know the Holy Spirit can rebuke you, and nobody knowing you won't feel bad in your little corner. Yes, the Holy Spirit have a way of just putting things so, you know, it's stated in such a way that it's like, you know, it's physical. It just, the impact is great. And you say, whoa. Hmm? And when you can see yourself, you'll do something about it. You're not going to be comfortable. The Holy Spirit won't let us be comfortable to, to live. You know, contrary to the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we're still human, but guess what? He has given us of his spirit. And through the spirit of the Lord, we can all live overcoming lives. Praise the Lord. We are able to overcome. Question. Praise the Lord. Individually. Okay. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise God. Pertaining to the forgiveness. You know, sometimes you have done something wrong. And you ask the Lord for forgiveness. How did you know the Lord forgive you? I know this is a tough one. So he's asking that sometimes you do something and you ask the Lord to forgive you. His question is, how do you know that the Lord has forgiven you? How do you know you have been forgiven? But we go to the Lord in faith, believing. And even if the Lord has not given you any sign at all that you are forgiven... You have got to claim it. You have got to claim it. Now, we must be mindful of the fact that the devil would want us to feel guilty, to be burdened and whatever, but we, we claim it. And because you, you're walking by faith, you are going to walk as if it has to happen. And you believe. And guess what? A lot of times, God forgive us, but we are so hard on ourselves that we still feel, boy. Yeah. So we ask the Lord to forgive us, brethren, he might not send somebody to come and tell you, you know, the Lord said to tell you that you are forgiven. He might not give you a dream or a vision, but you walk by faith, believing that he has forgiven you. Praise the Lord. Whatever you ask the Lord for, you, you believe that you receive it. Praise the Lord. We have to claim some things by faith. Not everything will go according to science, the logics, and you find, well, if this happened, that shall happen. No. 
But we walk, we're, we're walking by faith. Praise the Lord. And his word said that he will forgive us if we confess our sins. So you don't sit on the sin. You confess it and believe the word of the Lord and act. Act. God has forgiven me. I'm going to move. I'm not staying here. Oh, bless the Lord. Amen. Enough time. Well, there are a lot of times people mess up and we don't know. But as they mess up, you might stop reading your Bible and, and for a while until all sorts of thoughts crowd in your mind and you can't get them out. Guess what? Because you left you, 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 that space. You open up yourself to the adversary. But you go to God and you say, Lord, I have neglected reading of your word and consecrating my life. Lord, forgive me. And you start to believe that the Lord forgive you. You decide, I'm going to read. I'm going to meditate. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm not staying here. Because you know something? Backsliding is gradual. You stop doing something until you don't realize you don't miss it. You don't want to get to that place. So we ask God to forgive us, and we're moving on, believing him. And it, praise God. I'm going to be inviting us to stand. We're going to be closing in prayer. Praise the Lord. I want to, oh, there's another hand. Sorry about that. Didn't see you. Oh, it's a prayer request. Prayer request. Okay. Yes, sis, please go ahead. Yes. Or oh, she's requesting prayer for a friend in the U.S. who was having what kind of problem? Kidney problems. Praise the Lord. So we're going to pray, believe in God tonight. Believe in God for those who have joined us online as well. God is able. He's not limited. He's able to touch. So let's, let's believe God and lift our faith. Lord, we thank you for grace and mercy. We thank you, God, for making a way that we can escape the pollutions of this world. We thank you for saving us and saving us on time or in time. Lord, we come to you even now as we're about to go. We pray that your presence will cover us. We pray, Lord, for this friend in the U.S., of our sister, who is having problems with her kidneys. You are the one whose word declares it is you that have made us and not we ourselves. And so God, you are able to fix every part of our bodies. So I place her body in your hand and I pray that you lay your hand upon her kidneys that they will function like they should. Lord, you're able to reverse whatever is out of order. You're able to fix it, God, that it will flow, that it will filter the blood like it should, that it will excrete what needs to be excreted. And if there are stones there, God, you know how to shatter them, that they'll be passed out because you are almighty. Nothing is too hard for you. So we pray right now that you will intervene. And I pray for those tonight with a special request that God, you will minister to the needs of your children. We believe that you are able to do above what we can ask or think. And so God, we come just presenting these requests to you. As we're about to go, Lord, let your presence cover us. Let your presence be with us and continue to sustain us, Lord, as we go through the remainder of this week. And help us, Lord, that we'll so live that our lives will shine as lights to those who don't know you, that, Lord, they will come to you to worship you in spirit and in truth. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everyone. Be blessed as you go in Jesus' name. Praise God. May God bless you richly.